In video number one, I discussed the problem that ALP was invented to address, the problem of far too many students giving up and dropping out before completing either their developmental courses or English uh, 101, first year composition. In this videotape, I'm going to, going to discuss about uh, discuss our solution to that problem, which we call the Accelerated Learning Program, or ALP. Uh, but before I do, let me tell you a little bit about the context in which ALP was developed. That is, I'll tell you a little bit about the Community College of Baltimore County, CCBC. Um, we're a pretty, pretty large school. We've got almost 34,000 students spread over three campuses in Baltimore County, Maryland. Uh, our average student age is about 29. There are almost twice as many women as men among the student population. Students of color make up almost exactly half of our student body, and uh, African-American students make up by far the largest percentage of those students. And finally, uh, about two-thirds of our students are part-time and one-third full-time. Uh, at CCBC, we uh, place students into developmental education using the AccuPlacer. Um, we're not proud of that. Um, we're, we, we wish we could do some more enlightened version, and, and we're working on it, and I think one of these days we will uh, probably have developed a, a much more enlightened form of assessment for developmental courses. But we're, right now, we're still using the AccuPlacer. We're not recommending that to anyone else. Um, but we're using the AccuPlacer. 81% uh, of our students are placed in at least one developmental course. Math gets the largest percentage at 77%, English next, and reading slightly less. The math department offers three levels of developmental math, and the reading department two levels of developmental reading, and English offers two levels of developmental writing. It's this upper level developmental writing course, which we call English 052, that ALP is invented, uh, was invented to replace. Uh, after students successfully complete the developmental sequence in writing, they're then required to take two credit courses, English 101 and 102. English 101 is required in all of our AEA programs and all of our certificate programs. English 102, on the other hand, is required in all of our AA programs, but uh, only uh, around half of our certificate programs. So, finally, let's get to ALP and how it works. Uh, a student arrives on campus, is assessed, and uh, told that she needs uh, to take the upper-level developmental writing course, English 052. But she's also told that there's another option. She can uh, choose to go the ALP route. And if she does, what she does is register for an ALP-designated section of English 101. So there she is with her little red baseball cap on sideways. And she's joined in that English 101 section uh, by nine other developmental students. And those 10 developmental students are joined by 10 students whose, whose placement is English 101 and, of course, a teacher. Let me uh, quickly say that all of us who teach ALP, when we teach the ALP 101 class, um, we are deadly serious about the fact that this 101 will be no different from any other 101 that we teach, that we don't lower our standards, we don't give uh, shorter readings or easier readings, uh, assign easier readings or assign easier writing projects. Uh, we Almost all of us who teach AOP also teach some regular 101 sections, and we use exactly the same approach to the course in both the regular sections and the ALP sections. Now, uh, it's important to recognize that we, uh, while we created ALP here at CCBC, um, we didn't create it uh, out of nothing, and uh, there were a lot of innovations going on around the country that we stole ideas from uh, and then added a few of our own to develop the model that we call ALP. As far as I know, the earliest model uh, that attempted to do what was uh, a, a, a breathtakingly bold move back about 20 years ago, uh, which w w at, those at that time uh, we were calling mainstreaming, uh, that is letting developmental students directly into co uh, composition, in English, uh, first year composition, and then providing some additional kind of support 
The earliest place that I know of where that happened was at Arizona State University. And uh, there, um, a, a, a small group of faculty developed a program uh, that they called the Stretch Program. Greg Glau ran that program for years. It, the program is now 20 years old. Um, but in that program, students uh, who were, whose placement indicated they need to, needed developmental writing uh, were allowed to uh, uh, register for stretch sections of English 101. And those sections met for three hours a week for two semesters instead of one. So they had twice as much time in English 101. And um, the, the, at the end of the two semesters, uh, they got credit for passing the college level course, English 101. The major difference between the stretch program and ALP is that in, in our 101 sections, half the students are developmental and half are students whose placement is 101. And I want to explain why we added that to the model, why we, we changed the model from Arizona State in that way. But to do that, I need to back up and talk about things, some things I've observed about developmental students uh, over the 36 years that I've been teaching developmental writing. And let me hasten to add that, uh, of course, not all developmental students are alike. Any generalizations that I make are only true generally. They're, that's what generalizations are, and there will, there will be tons of exceptions. But nevertheless, I think uh, that uh, we can safely say that developmental students, basic writers' sense of belonging in college is a lot more fragile than that sense is for students who are placed directly into credit courses. That too often developmental students arrive, and my students tell me this, they tell me, I'm not sure I'm college material. And I really wonder, where did they hear that? Where did they learn that phrase? Who taught them that? As if human beings come in two types, college material and not college material, and they might be in the second type. Um, and, you know, it, it's their, their, their sense that they that they really belong, that they can do this, that this is that that, that we want them there is very very fragile. It's very, and 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 so um, it, we, we, they 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 show up on it. Remember that many of these students are the first generation to go to college. Their parents may not have gone to college. Their friends may not be going to college. Um, and I like to to say that for most of my developmental students, it's a very courageous decision to go to college. After all, their experience with education up to this point in their lives, in many, many cases, has not been very successful. It's not been very reaffirming. In fact, in some cases, it's been humiliating. And despite that experience, despite their doubt about their whether they belong in college or not, they made the decision to give it a try and, and to sign up for two or four or six more years of, of education. And I think that's a very courageous decision. So they make this decision. Often they they make it fairly fairly late in life. Lots of uh, middle class kids uh, know that they're going to college. The only question is what college will they get into? They've been thinking about it since early in their educational experience. For most of our students, the decision was made in August, just before they show up on our doorstep. But show up they do, and here they come. I'm going to college. I'm going to college. They say. And then what's the first thing we say to them? Well, not so fast there. You're not really in college. You're going to have to take these pre-college courses to get you up to college level skills. And that only aggravates the insecurities, the, the lack of, 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 of a sense of belonging, the, the, um, the lack of attachment to the college, the fear they don't belong. And so the traditional approach to developmental ed only increases those kinds of negative factors in their, in their psyches. So ALP works against that. Uh, they, not only are they placed directly into a college-level course, English 101, and, and just that alone reduces the stigma they feel, uh, the, the embarrassment, the having to go home and tell their friends, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in college, but I'm not in college-level courses. They put me in remedial courses. You know, they, they don't. They can say, I'm in college, I'm in English 101, and this, so that the, the sense of embarrassment about not being in college, being in these co courses that they have to pay college tuition for but don't get college credit for, is greatly reduced. In addition, their sense that they belong in college is greatly improved. 
After all, they're in college, and they're in a college-level course. But for me, the most important advantage of our model is that it puts them in a classroom with 10 other students who are stronger role models. They're stronger writers. Not that all the 101-level students are wonderful writers, but some of them are. Not only are they stronger writers, but they're also stronger at doing college. They know how to find their way around the library. They know how to go see an instructor and ask for help. They know how to fill out the FAFSA form. And we think all of that is very helpful, as well as, of course, the, the fact that when we do group work, when we have them give feedback on each other's papers, we think it makes much more sense to have developmental students in a, in a class in which the whole class is, are not similarly weak writers, but some of them are stronger writers. So those are the three advantages we see to that part of the model. The second part of the model is that in the same semester, usually at our school, the hour after the English 101 section meets, these uh, the, our little developmental student with a red cap also takes a section of our developmental writing course, English 052, along with the same nine other students and the same instructor. Now that means that those 10 students and that instructor are spending six hours a week together, half that time in a very small section of only 10 students. And let's talk about what, what we think are the advantages of this part of the model. First of all, it encourages the cohort effect. Now the cohort effect has been uh, well demonstrated and, and much admired at those schools that offer learning communities. Um, if you are familiar with the concept in learning communities, students sign up uh, as a group for two or sometimes three or even more uh, different courses which they take together. And that there's considerable evidence that learning community movement started out in Washington State. And there's considerable evidence that, that allowing students to move through several courses as a cohort greatly increases their attachment to the college, the fact that they have friends in college, um, the, a sort of a support group for them while they're going through college. So we borrowed that idea from the learning communities movement. And I might as well go ahead and thank our, our third source of ideas, and that is the idea that the developmental course should be very small, in our case, 10 students. By the way, it used to be eight. You may have heard that somewhere. But um, in, in the last year, we've upped the size to 10, and that we have not been able to, to detect any negative effect on the, uh, on the students in the course. Uh, in fact, our, our advice is that uh, 12 is okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we, we, we're happy with 10, and we're getting very good results. But um, we, we, we do think the small class size is important, but it doesn't have to be exactly the size we have. So the cohort effect. It also, and this is for me the most dramatic dramatic benefit, to me this has been the most dramatic benefit, and that is um, in the traditional approach to developmental education, I generally spend a good deal of time in September of every fall semester or in February of every spring semester having to explain to my students, having, having to answer their questions about why do they have to take this course? Why do they have to pay college tuition and they don't get credit? After all, they tell me their English teacher in high school said they were a pretty good writer. And when you go to the ALP model, there's such a, a dramatic difference in that. Their attitude towards the course has changed not 100%, but about 90%. Most of that negativity disappears. In the traditional course, I found myself frequently saying, pay attention, this will be really helpful next semester when you get to English 101. I don't think my, most of my students believe me. Most of my students have not found courses that they have taken have been helpful in, in later courses. And why would this one be? But you don't have to say that anymore in the ALP program because what they're learning today in the little ALP class will be helpful on the paper that they're writing this weekend for the 101 class. In other words, by taking the ALP, the, taking the developmental work and making it a co-requisite rather than a prerequisite to English 101, it puts it puts the, the developmental work in a in a context where it's Im almost immediately helpful, and that changes students' attitudes towards the course. The small class size, I've already uh, said, we're, we're we're pretty sure is a major part of our success. The small class size makes it possible to to work with individuals on their particular set of problems, 
so that if one student is struggling with apostrophes, you can work with her or him on apostrophes, and the whole class doesn't have to listen to something that they don't need, that they're already competent in. It also allows time for non-cognitive issues. Non-cognitive issues is a sort of an umbrella term that we use for all of those things that our students have told us threaten their ability to stay in school. Those life issues, um, medical problems, losing their jobs, getting promoted at work, getting a full-time job, uh, being evicted from their apartments, all of those possible life issues, and those affective issues, the ones that um, are, are more involved with their psyches, with their sense of confidence, of belonging, of, of, of being able to, to, to do this thing called college. And so we can talk about those things, and we do uh, in the course uh, at various points. And uh, then having the same instructor for both courses, we think is important because it means that the two courses can be coordinated. Let me just give one quick example. Uh, early in the semester in the English 101 class, I sometimes ask students to write a paper <clears throat> in which um, they um, uh, discuss a, a, a frequently uh, argued point about American society, that in America, if you work hard, you'll get ahead. Well, in the weeks leading up to that paper, in the developmental course, I have my students do some, I call them sh short writings or one-pagers, um, little short writings. One of them, I ask them to write about someone they know who worked really hard, and it paid off. And they write those. And what's really interesting, we look at some of those papers in class, is how differently different people think about what what, it, what is hard work. Uh, some people think you have to sweat. Some people think it's how many hours you work and so forth. And similarly, getting ahead. What does getting ahead mean? And so we thought, and then I asked them to write a second little short writing in class or maybe at home in which they tell me about somebody they know who worked really hard and it didn't pay off. They didn't get ahead. And then then when after they've written those two papers, the next week they wrote, come into 101 and here's this assignment that asked them to think about the broader question in American society. Is it true that if you work hard, you'll get ahead? They've already thought about the two key terms, working hard and getting ahead, and they've got two concrete examples that they may or may not choose to include in the paper. And it's that kind of coordination that works much better if the same instructor teaches both courses. So that's how ALP works. Now, um, what, uh, about a year ago, I was doing a workshop out in Michigan, and one of the faculty members there uh, pointed out to me that that the the um, the ALP model. She'd been doing ALP for about a year. The ALP model actually changes the goal of of, of developmental writing. Of of and, and that in a traditional developmental writing course, the goal and it, she said it was true for her in Michigan, and it's certainly true for me in Maryland is for students to pass the developmental course and be ready for first year composition. Whereas the goal in an ALP developmental course, the goal is for students to pass English 101. And, and, and so it's a different goal and it changes the whole feeling of the class. I'm not talking about the developmental class, the one with the 10 students, the one that for us meets in the hour after the 101 class. Um, in traditional classes, developmental writing classes, um, the general approach is let's um, if, if they have to they have to learn to walk before they can run. Um, what that means in writing classes is uh, they have to learn grammar, they have to learn the parts of speech, they have to be able to write grammatically correct sentences and then move on to paragraphs and the paragraphs have to be structured in a fairly formal way. And, and uh, so what they're doing in traditional developmental classes is, preliminary steps to get them ready for 101. In ALP, that's not what we do in the developmental class. What we're doing in the developmental class is the same kind of work we're doing in 101. We call it backwards curriculum design. We take, we do the same kind, we ask them to read the same kinds of readings and do the, write the same kinds of papers in response to them as they're doing in 101. But of course in the developmental class, because it's so small, they get a lot more individual attention, a lot more help, a lot more feedback, a lot more scaffolding. So, so it, but it changes the feel for the course. Even in the developmental section, it feels like college. It doesn't feel like they're back in the fifth grade. And we think that helps a lot with those non-cognitive issues, those sense, 
the students wondering whether they belong or not. We think the fact that it feels like they're doing college level work is one of the strengths of our program. To be a little more specific, here's some examples of the kinds of things we do. The, the overall goal is to maximize our students' probability of success in the 101 class. So the kinds of things we do, first of all, much of the class time is spent as a writing workshop. Some people are revising papers, some people are brainstorming, some people are giving each other feedback. Um, so it's a supplement, an extension to what goes on in the 101 class. We almost always start the, the developmental class by asking, are there any questions left over from the 101 class? Uh, we provide opportunities for more writing practice. We do, I, I already mentioned earlier the short writing assignments that we do. We also do a lot of work on uh, um, uh, previewing and predicting um, with readings that they're going to be doing in the 101 class. We brainstorm and discuss ideas for the next essay that's coming up in 101. We review drafts of essays that students are working on in the 101 class. We do work on the frequency and severity of error in students' writing, and I've worded that very carefully. I, I didn't want to say we teach grammar, because that's not that for most people that conjures up thoughts of, well, let's start with the eight parts of speech and so forth, if, if in fact there are eight. I, 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 I understand that linguists have, we, we we're now up to 11 or 12 parts of speech if you listen to contemporary linguists, but whatever the number is, um, we don't want, we don't, we don't want to start by with a review of traditional grammar. What we want to focus on is, is just what it says on, in this bulleted item, reducing the frequency and severity of error in students' writing. So we're not interesting, interested in turning our students into proficient grammarians, but what we are interested in is making them into proficient editors of their own writing. And that's the focus, and, and so the focus is on working on grammar in their papers, working on grammar uh, uh, only as needed, and working on grammar in small groups with just those students who need a particular little a little review in a particular area. And finally, we have time to address those non-cognitive issues. I want to just give one example of this. A lot that when we ask students what might cause them to drop out of school, the most frequent response was financial issues, and um, and so we thought well, it would be good if we could address some of those financial issues somehow in this course. And uh, one of the ways that we do that, and just this is just an example of the kinds of things we do on non-cognitive issues, is a lot of us ask our students to write a little research paper, a little mini research paper, M-I-N-I -I research paper, uh, uh, maybe a one-pager. And we give them a list of topics like these. Uh, uh, do some research into the new uh, satisfactory academic progress rules for the Pell Grant. Uh, write a paper exploring the pros and cons of a student loan or or payday loan and and the pros and cons of credit cards and so forth. So we give them financial literacy topics to write about. And then in class, when we're talking about those papers, we're both talking about writing and at the same time we're talking about issues that will help them become more savvy about handling their own finances. So we're trying where we can, that's what, that works really well, that we're not taking a time away from writing to talk about personal finance, but we're doing both at the same time. <clears throat> Finally, it's often been said, let me back up on that slide a little bit, it's often been said that, uh, in fact, Hunter Boylan, the uh, sort of founding father of NAID, the National Association for Developmental Education, uh, wrote this in a journal article last uh, spring. Um, it's often been said, and other, lots of other people have said this as well, not just, not just uh, um, Hunter Boylan, um, and, and that is that the people keep asserting that ALP does seem to work pretty well for students close to the cutoff for 101, for students who are just a few points below being ready for 101. And I want to end this videotape uh, disagreeing with that statement. Um, at, at our school, remember that 35% uh, of our students place directly into English 101, which means 65% place into one of our two developmental writing courses. Of that 65%, 87% are placed in the upper level developmental writing course, the one we call English 052. Only 13% are placed in our lower level course, English 051. What I want to make sure is clear in this video is that every student whose placement 
is English 052. All 87% of those students are eligible for ALP. Now, if you consider 87% to be close to the cutoff, okay, then you then then I agree with you. It's close to, but it, but it's not. I mean, it's not just within a few points of of being close. To, in fact, in the next video, in which I discuss the results and go over some data, you will see that in fact we've discovered that ALP has a stronger positive effect on the success rate of students who scored lower down in that 87%. Um, cohort than students who played placed close to the cutoff. Uh, all everybody benefits from it, but the lower performing students on the assessment uh, benefit even more. So we think that uh, with an ALP, we we hope when other schools decide to give ALP a try, that they will not limit it just to students who are close to the cutoff, but limit it to a large percentage, if if not all, of their developmental writers. So that concludes video number two, and the third video coming up next is uh, the, the one on data, the one that will give you a lot of information about uh, the results we've achieved with ALP at uh, the Community College, Baltimore County. Thanks.